Welcome, Let's Talk Books. I'm Robin Van Auken, a writer and a teacher. My guest and I want to help you write your own book. We're sharing ideas about inspiration, book publication, and promotion. You can find the episode show notes, a free novel, guides, and tutorials at robinvanauken.com. Enjoy the show. Today is December 9th, 2017, and it's episode number four. My guest is Mike Ruther, a writer with a daily newspaper and the author of more than a dozen books. In his 30 years as a reporter, Mike's covered politics, crime, government, health care, and sports. Today we're talking about his love of books and how he finds time to write his novels, as well as self-help books for other writers. His fictional characters are complex, interesting people who find themselves in tough situations. You'll learn about Homer Newbody a young baseball pitcher who loves a game so much he tells a world he'd play for free in Mike's novel, Nothing Down. Homer's honesty brings him a bit of notoriety, as well as criticism from other baseball players, who, by the way, enjoy playing for huge salaries. Mike also talks about his new book, Pitching for Sanity, a story about anxiety-ridden Bill Barrister, who's on a journey of self-discovery. Mike gives sage advice to other writers in today's interview, and you'll learn he advocates a friendly, yet no-nonsense approach to writing. You can learn more about Mike and his books in the show notes at robinvanauken.com. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. I'm Robin Van Auken, the wholehearted author, and I'm talking books with Mike Ruther. Welcome. How you doing? (laughs) I'm doing fine. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about yourself. I know you personally. I've worked with you in the past, but but the public needs to know who you are. What is your profession? I work as a news reporter at a local newspaper, and I've been there for 18 and a half years, and that's basically my background. I've, I've worked for newspapers since I was about 30 years old. I had a few other jobs in between. I did some sales, which I wasn't very good at. and uh, I tried a few other things, but for most of the past 30 years, I've been in newspaper work. So, How did you come to writing as a journalist and then as a book author? Well, I I started college late. Uh, I was in my early 20s when when I actually went back to school after... <clears throat> four years in the military, in the Air Force. And I was always a big reader. I was a voracious reader. I, was, I always had a book, you know. Uh, and that, that was pretty much the segue into writing. I always thought, eh, maybe I could put, you know, string some words together at some point in my life. You know, I was always inspired by some of the different authors like Thomas Wolfe and Steinbeck and a few of, a few of the other so-called, you know, uh, uh, classic authors who wrote the, you know, the big books. So that, that's kind of how it started. I, I went to school. I liked the writing courses more than I liked anything else, as I thought I would. And, I, you know, I ended up majoring in journalism, mass communications, and I eventually got a job for a newspaper, and I went from there. Excellent. So that's what happened. <laughs> so tell me, what exactly do you write about now with the newspaper? Well, right now I do... Uh, business and politics. Uh, over the years, I've covered everything from health care to, you know, the local police beat. I still pitch in on the police beat now and then. Uh, so just about everything, really, that a newspaper needs to fill up its pages, I've, <laughs> I've been called upon to write, you know, even a column here and there. Now, you've seen a lot of changes in the newspaper industry over the past five, ten years. Yeah. How, what is your prognosis with the newspaper industry? Well, I think we're always going to need newspapers, you know, whether they're something you hold or whether it's online. And let's face it, it pretty much is going the way of, uh, you know, online reading. You know, people always want to know what's going on in their local communities. So I think there's always going to be some okay. kind of newspaper or newspapers out there for people, even though... There is a lot of other information where people are able to access. So you were an early ad- adopter of online books, weren't you? Tell me a little bit about your interest in ebooks and how you got started thinking and writing ebooks. 
I don't know if I was real early. Well, I, yeah, 2011, I, I got my first ebook out. And, uh, you know, it looked like a, uh, it was an opportunity for writers who, for many years, like me, pursued traditional publishing and didn't have a whole lot of luck at it. Trying to get an agent, trying to find a publisher, people who were interested in your work. And it's, you know, I, I, whoever's listening out there, if you're, if you're thinking about writing a book and <laughs> you want to go the traditional route, well, you may be in for a long haul because it's tough, you know. I, so and to make a long story short, you know, ebooks were an opportunity for me to, you know, cut to the chase. I well, didn't have to go through all the gatekeepers, <laughs> the agents, the publishers. Right. I could self-publish. So. Well, actually, we don't want to make that long story short. We, <laughs> we want to stretch it out a little bit. Don't be too journalistic yeah. here. So tell me, your first book that you published mm-hmm. yourself as an independent publisher, what was the title of it and what was it about? Return to Dead City, uh, a mystery. Uh, it had a baseball background to it. It was about a ball player who got murdered. And... We had this. We had the uh, uh, hard-boiled sleuth who tried to solve the case, and who well, I guess I shouldn't give it away, but you <laughs> that, that was basically the story. It's okay. Kurt if, anybody wants, says. if anybody wants to read it out there, <laughs> Return to Dead City. No, but anyway, that was my first book. I figured mystery would be a great market to try and tap, and I, and I liked reading mysteries. You know, I read Lawrence Block and you know Robert Parker and some of the other mystery writers, and I always enjoyed a good. A good thriller, a good, uh, you know, whodunit. Is mystery your favorite genre? No, no, it, it really isn't my favorite genre, but I enjoy it, you know. I, I really haven't read as, a whole lot of mysteries uh, in recent years, but... Uh, and then you wrote a second book about baseball this time. I wrote time. a second beta- book about baseball. About Homer. About Homer, Homer new buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and this became an Amazon bestseller. Well, it became a bestseller in a very tight narrow, niche. <laughs> tight well, niche. That's okay. We want to hear all about this. I guess, base, I guess baseball fiction for a few days, it was right up there at the top. So, in fact, I think it was number one for a few days. So, yeah, I mean... How thrilling was that? Well, that was pretty cool. But, you know, it's, it doesn't last long. No, no, <laughs> it never does. It <laughs> didn't make me a millionaire. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Homer. Homer... Uh, idealistic young man, probably very naive as well, small town, loved baseball, lived for baseball, uh, made an announcement to some uh, media people that uh, you know, he'd be willing to play for nothing. <laughs> and that got him into a little bit of hot water because people didn't believe he was for real. So... That was what he was battling with. He made the majors, and he was this sensation, but who is this guy, you know? <laughs> he, can't be, he can't be everything he says he is, you know? So that was, that was the battle Homer had in uh, that book, you know? It, now, you've written a few other books that are self-help. I had no idea the depth of the books that you've got available yeah, they're writing books. I, you know, I, why not share what you know you've been through as a writer? You know, you know let other people, you know, uh, look and see what it is that you have to go through to try and to try and write, to try and publish, and so forth. So you know, I wrote, I, I, I got some of that down in some in some quick e-books, you know, and then. Uh, it was something to explore. I don't know if I would go back to that. You know, I, I might have everything I had to say. Well, you have a handful books. of them, don't yeah, you? You have yeah. about six of them out there. I have about six of them. Uh, most of them are pretty short books. You know, thirty pages or so. Uh, you know, write the darn book is a little bit longer. That was the first one I wrote. You know, that covers the gamut from, you know, sitting down and getting the words down on paper to try and find a trying to find a publisher to, you know, going the agent route. Uh, and so that's, that, that was the first one I wrote. And then after that I wrote, you know, something that narrowed in, some books that narrowed into, you know, different things such as writing fiction and writing the ebook and and so forth. Well, I was looking at your freelance writing book 
And and this is very encouraging. Each one of the chapters, and I also noticed that there's a baseball anecdote in there as well. You have yeah. a lot of baseball. Well, there has to be a baseball anecdote in there. Tell me about your that's always passion. Been a, that's always been a passion of mine. So <laughs> tell us about that. When did you first start being interested in baseball? Were you on the little league team? Oh sure, yeah. Now you yeah. grew up here in the area in Muncie. a small town named Muncie, Muncie right? Right. Did you also attend the Muncie School? I yeah, I graduated from Muncie High School. Yeah, long time ago. And then <laughs> and then after high school, you went into the Air Force. Then I went into the Air Force for four Did years. Did you play ball? I played for so- school. I played softball in the Air Force. No, I didn't play in high school. I mean, I played summer leagues. I there was always American Legion and and uh, what they called intermediate ball between Little League and American Legion. That was, But that was strictly summer. We had no high school team back then. A lot of these schools around here didn't have high school teams, which was interesting. <laughs> but they're tiny. <laughs> Muncie is a very small town. Yeah, yeah, but it's got high school ball now, but back then it didn't for whatever reason. I don't know. A lot of schools dropped the programs. Uh, so you grew up in Muncie, and then you joined the Air Force. Did you come back here after the Air Force and back, go to college? I, I came back here, yeah. Was yes. that on the GI Bill? Yes, it was. <laughs> and what school did you go to? What I went, college? I went, I went to what then was the Williamsport Area Community College. Now is Penn College. And I later went to Bloomsburg, and then I went on to Penn State. Okay. So. All right. Did you enjoy your time at Penn State? You know, as much as you can enjoy, you know, <laughs> going to a, going to graduate school. You're always you're always eager to get out. That's what that was. I was I was going for a master's in journalism, and uh, you know, I, I I think you've been through the graduate program. Too. Yes, <laughs> you're always, I was eager to get out, <laughs> join the real world. I was not an I was not an eager or excellent student in elementary, middle, or high school. I mean, I could get, I got excellent grades, but I skipped all the time. I was a smart aleck. Um, I joke that I spent too much time in the smoking area (laughs) back when schools used to allow you to smoke in a certain area. In my um, 10th grade, I skipped completely, just jumped a grade because I hated school so much. 11th grade, I literally skipped about 65 days of school. Some of those were spent uh, going to the beach. You know, as a group, we'd like hang out in the parking lot, get into a car, and hit the road. Oh, wow. Then in senior, I skipped about 30 days because by then it had become a habit, you know, and I was just like sleeping late. So I've been cursed ever since then not to leave school. Well, and, I, I was I was an indifferent student. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> well, I just I felt that I wasn't getting too much. I mean, I hate to say this, you know, because I'm a I'm a teacher now. Yeah. I've been teaching for 15 years well, at this local. We all change. College we all evolve. And, <laughs> what yeah. is it about school that um, doesn't interest writers? I've noticed that this is kind of a common theme. Is it? Yeah, I don't know. Is it because our imaginations are not being tapped? Maybe we're thinking about oh, yeah. what's out there. I guess I, I, I was never able to sit still too, you know, too well. So that, that's kind of a. But that's not a guy thing, is it? That's a girl thing as well. So, I mean, you, so I you, have, you indicated that you. <laughs> Yeah, I have a bit of that like, attention you deficit. Like, you didn't like me in school. <laughs> well, I, I didn't, and, and they didn't like me in school either because, you know, I was that kid uh, in first grade that the teacher literally taped my mouth shut. <laughs> I, you know, back then they didn't say, oh, you've got attention deficit disorder. You need to take a, you know, a well, drug. No, they just said, get in your chair well, and tape that that's mouth true. shut. That's true. And they always get those report cards home that said, Robin is a joy in class, however. It's always like, but. So you, what is your creative process? Now, you've been telling people in your self-help books, but what works for you? I just, you just start writing. I mean, uh, you don't wait for the muse to hit you. You just... You but just, the muse, <laughs> waiting for the muse is a great excuse. I don't want to throw that one away. How do you get into the chair I, and start writing? I used writing? to think there was this strange power, you know, that, that, that you know, you had to wait to come over you before you could get into that creative process. But you, just have, to, it. you just have to start writing. Of course, some days are better than others. <laughs> so how, how long do you write? When you sit down in the chair, how long do you give yourself Depends if my wife bothers me or not. No. <laughs> uh, 
you know, days vary. You know, a good day, I'll be in the chair for, you know, three hours right in the way. Wow. But, you know, I have a full-time job, so it's not always easy to find the time. You know, I try to write in the morning before I go to go to work, uh, but other things come up, you know, appointments and, uh, you know, what have you. So, I mean, a, a perfect day is, you know, what I say, three hours, yeah, two to three hours anyway. So I you're try, a morning try, writer. Yeah, I'm a morning writer. Right? Mm. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I read about that. I read about people who actually get up early. And, and I did speak with one person, Diane Langley. She would wake up in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, go to her computer, write, <laughs> print, go back to bed. And I'm like, what? I love laying in bed under the covers, especially after the alarm goes on. I'm like, yeah. Well, I do too. I mean, I don't hop right up, but... Uh... But well, yeah, you get up and you write in the morning. I don't get up that early, though. I mean, I get up, you know, at a reasonable time. Okay, so, so then what <laughs> Maybe kind 8 of... Maybe 8 o'clock and... So your job, then, allows you to come in at a slightly later time? Yeah, I don't, I don't is is usually, that how your schedule yeah, I'm not is? usually until 10.30. Okay, so. all righty. I guess because so I this is a daily newspaper and you I, have a deadline at 11 at night? Right. But, you know, but as you well know, newspaper work, <laughs> the hours vary. So. They do. So, some days you don't have to go in until the afternoon, and that gives you a big window. Right. I mean, those are the best writing days, you know. So tell me about some of the characters. Do you get a lot of your characters from your experience as a journalist? Well, it's hard to say, really. I mean, you know, characters are composites of a lot of people. Uh, I don't know. I Where, where the characters come from, they just kind of... They just kind of come. <laughs> so that goes back to that whole idea of the muse being this magical person. So maybe, maybe there's something to it. You're right. They do just appear, don't they? Yeah. I mean, I'm not one of these people who wakes up in the morning and writes down my dream from the night before. Although that might not be a bad idea. I've heard of writers who do that. Uh, they write down their dreams and then they use those dreams for their material. I might start you in that. I don't, I, I don't like that. I, I love to dream. I dream a lot. I have very vivid yeah. dreams. My husband, he cannot recall his dreams. All right. But I don't want to write about them. I, I Instead, I come downstairs and I bore my <laughs> husband with it. Or my daughter and I will both get on the phone and tell each other these long, drawn-out, exciting episodes. Well, that's cool. Well, that's great. Uh, no, where, where the characters come from, I I don't know. I mean, I've been around how long? Sixty years on this earth. <laughs> I think I got a, I think I got a big reservoir. But you came from, from, from a tiny draw, town. From which to draw from? <laughs> <laughs> don't underestimate uh, uh, small towns. There's there's plenty of uh, things going on in small towns. <laughs> so you actually live in the same small town? No, no. I live. Oh. Down, I live. I live in the other town over, or kind of outside the other town over, outside Montgomery. So, Outside yeah. Montgomery, but, which is what, but, about two miles away from <laughs> Muncie? So in the miles. scheme of Five like, miles. Yeah. Five miles, okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your self-publishing and the hurdles that you had to overcome. Uh, the hurdles? Well, I mean, you're kind of your, the captain of your own ship, so... Like I said, you don't have you don't have those gatekeepers preventing you from being published. You don't have someone telling you, "Well, this needs work, and you need to uh, uh, change this." And uh, we still might not publish it. <clears throat> I mean, to self-publish, you can just write what you want and get it out there. <laughs> so when you first started writing for yourself, you realized, I'm going to have to independently publish this. I'm going to go with Amazon. Did you also go with other book suppliers? What was your process, your technical process like? Yeah, I I went with Amazon, you know, uh, you know, when I was discovering that there was this e-book opportunity out there and that, you know, authors were tapping this. And uh, so that, that's, that's what I went with. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, look at any other mark. Well, I, I think I did. I did. I did some research and looked around. But yeah, that's what I went with. Uh, was Amazon? Uh, no, let me back up. I went with Smashwords first. That's right. Okay. I went with Smash. I did go with Smashwords 
for for the first year or so, and it, it didn't seem like uh, that was a, a real a real strong market. Uh, and I was actually listening to a podcast of a woman one night, and she said she told the group that was listening in that you really should go to Amazon because they're the you know the, that's where all the readers are. So that's what I did. And uh, well, I I always viewed Smashwords basically as a conduit to get your book mm -hmm. into the ebook format, yeah. and then put it out as that Mobi file or that EPUB file. Um, until I just got tired of the meat grinder. That's uh, the, the meat system. Grinder. The meat yeah, grinder. Yeah. The meat I, grinder. I know exactly what you're talking. And about. if you're a writer <laughs> and you use Smashwords, and you know the problem with uh, the meat grinder, that was basically. Another... Mm -hmm. And and it is very irritating. And so I um have I they, actually have they cleaned that up yet? I don't know. I abandoned <laughs> it a year or two ago, and I went draft to digital, um, so that you know I can get a cleaner EPUB. Um, I use a software now called Scrivener. Are you familiar with that? I, I I've heard of it. I'm, I don't know how it works. It is I'm, immensely complicated. No, I'm not kidding you. I'm. I'm pretty brilliant when it comes to computers. I was taking computers apart, putting them together, pirating software in the 90s. Really? Massively, because I worked at a science museum. I know how to use software. I'm so cool with this. Scrivener befuddles me. I mean, I use maybe <laughs> one 20th of its, its, its power. It's, it is a superpower of a software, and it's only like $50. It's so easy. It's so inexpensive to buy. You just put it on your computer. Um, but using all of its bells and whistles is just befuddling to me. I'm, I'm a very simple person. So tell me something. How do you market your books? Now, it's one thing to sit down every morning, yeah. put in two or three hours, go through the meat grinder, go have, to Amazon. I don't have the magic bullet for marketing books. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's out there listening who's looking to make a lot of money writing their books, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> this, is, this is not true. The reason why I want to talk to you is because everybody fails. I fail. I have failed tremendously at marketing my books. When I first started writing them, you know that I wrote them under a, a, a pen name. I was too embarrassed to write under my own name. Um I've since then come out of the closet. All of my romance novels are now under my name. And you know what? It was really a, uh, a decision I made because I figured it might help the Amazon algorithm. <laughs> it wasn't so much that, you know, I didn't want to stay Madeline Sloan. I, I just, I was exhausted keeping up two I platforms. I didn't know you were Madeline Sloan there for a while. I remember, I remember getting some, you know, uh, social media messages from you. And, yeah. But I didn't know you were Madeline Sloan. No, I kept that You, you gave quiet. me a like or two on some of my books. And I, okay, who's mm. Madeline Sloan? And I didn't realize. <laughs> I, didn't realize <laughs> I was I really, doing a good job. I did not know you were Madeline Sloan for a while there. Yep, it took me quite a while <laughs> because I was, in, I was embarrassed. Here I was writing novels and I didn't want people to say, oh my God, that's her. <laughs> I, 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 I write whatever you want. I mean, yeah. Well, and you know, we Who talked about genres. Judge? You've Who written, judge? <laughs> you wrote mysteries, but you said it's not your favorite genre. It's not my favorite. Well, genre. you see, that's no. how I felt. It was easy for me to work <laughs> on a romance novel, but it's not my favorite genre. And and if I am writing, um, I'm writing contemporary romance. If I am reading a romance novel, it's almost always a historical romance. Right. So it's I'm not even writing in the genre I'm comfortable right. reading. Right. So what are you doing to market books? And, and what did you try and what failed? What did you try and what succeeded? Well, you know, <laughs> low budget as much as possible because I, I right. don't have deep pockets. So I, Few you writers know, do. You know, they say, you know, they say, you know, you got to make, you got to spend money to make money. Okay. You know, I, I've tried some of these uh, uh, different uh, marketing strategies strategies uh, you know spending a little money to get it advertised and you know you get it, it does help a little as far as selling books but it doesn't it never seems to work quite the way you want it to so I mean I I I get on Amazon and I use the promotion 
uh, you know, for 99 cent free books. You know, I'll mark my book down to free or 99 cents. And I'll, I'll try to get readers that way. And I'll get on Facebook and I'll get on some different social media and, you know, say, you know, free book today only. And, you know, that works only so well. <laughs> You get because a, you you've get, got you get, a lot you of get competition. Some downloads. You get a, oh, you, there's enormous competition, which goes back to the whole ebook thing. Because once that ebook market was opened up to writers, more people became writers. Is it stopping you <laughs> from catch, writing? It's a catch twenty two. It was great to have it, but it was more people were out there writing, more competition. Of course, you shouldn't think that way, should you? You're just going to write no matter what. Well, we're going to think that way no matter what. It's only human nature. So it is whether, true. So whether the competition is there or not, I, I think I'm going to be out there writing. But, you know, it's frustrating. You'd, you'd like to make a little bit of money off your writing. Or a little bit of even, a return. just a little bit. I mean, because you've got a spouse in the other room that says, hey, hey, you're spending all your time there on that computer writing that book. <laughs> Let's see yeah. some money from that. Yeah. What was your question, though? Did I answer it? I'm I was sure. talking about marketing. What's working <laughs> oh, for you oh, in what's marketing? Wor- oh, what's working? We talked about marketing, but I see. I, I don't know if any one thing is working. I think you got to spend money to make money. But but I haven't really. I haven't. I <laughs> I haven't been willing to mortgage the house on marketing. There are to people do that, to do that. Maybe it'll. Do maybe that. it would work. Uh, I have been reading a few. <laughs> A few um, different blog posts that are critical that say, you know, hey, this person bought their way onto the New York Times bestsellers list. Um, they bought 9,000 copies of their own book because I, I think that's what the, the cutoff is, is maybe 9,000 copies in one week of your book being sold. Um, 9,000 copies of a book to get on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> Me, he, you know, <laughs> seriously, if I had the money to order 9,000 copies of my own book, would I? Would I? And then just give them away. Um, you know, buying copies of your own book for promotional purposes is not a bad idea. It is, a, it is actually, you know, it's tax write-off for one thing. Um, but buying your way onto the New York Times bestsellers list. Eh. I'm not even, uh, you know, <laughs> part of me would love to be on the New York Times bestseller list. But let's be honest here. You know, I'm a mediocre uh, romance writer, you know, for the most part. Oh, the best book I ever wrote was with my husband, and the truth is, he's a much better writer than I am. I don't want to say that too loud. Uh, my contributions were highly technical. I wrote all of the sidebars in the book. I conducted the interviews. Mm-hmm. I transcribed everything. Um, I got all the photos, and I wrote the captions. He is the one who sat down and wrote the prose in between all of these technical pieces, and and that's why the book that we wrote, that the play ball, the story of Little League Baseball, was a successful book. So you've got some self-help books. Is this because other writers reached out to you? No, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of that. I, that's just something I decided to do. Uh, I pumped them out kind of fast, as I remember. And... Uh, you know, it was another market to tap, see if, you know, people would, you know, buy it. Uh, so, so I figured you, it was worth sharing with other people what I've been through. You know, it was kind of fun to write that stuff. I do but, know exactly what you mean. That's why I created this wholehearted you know, author you know, platform. You know, we, you know, let's face it, we all like to talk about ourselves a little bit. <laughs> Didn't Dale Carnegie say that? Everyone's favorite subjects is themselves. <laughs> Do you have any free books right now? Uh, today I actually have one, but it's only for a day. So, pitching for sanity. <laughs> Another baseball book. <laughs> Another. Well, it, it's not real. Ba- it's it, it's baseball, but not so much. I mean, it's about a guy who throws a ball as much as he can. Yeah, he's a retired. To get, to get his sanity. Oh, oh he was a military. <laughs> I was, a, I was he reading. Was, he was a veteran. Yeah, he was a veteran. And, uh, yeah. So. And he has a little post-traumatic stress it, coming yeah, home. Yeah, it's kind of a road book, really. It's kind of a road buddy book. He, he hooks up with this barroom friend, and they go out on the road, and <laughs> they delve into his past a little bit. He looks up his ex-wife, and... Uh, they're kind of they're kind of uh, going through midlife crisis, you might say. But but he's got some more problems. He's a he's a he's an alcoholic, and he's got these 
anxiety uh, issues that he's trying to trying to work through. So now, is this book based upon your experience with the military from years ago, or what you see happening today? Where did this character oh, yeah, come from? Well, yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, he, you know, I was I was in the military for four years, and I worked security, and this guy worked security, but he did it for twenty years, which I think would be enough to drive anybody. Half bananas. <laughs> and there was an issue in the book where he witnessed uh, one of his co-workers committing suicide. And that kind of, that was one of the uh, triggers that uh, caused him to really become an anxiety-ridden person. <laughs> so he's been battling that issue for years. And, you know, anyway... It's many years later. It's 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 after he's out of the military, goes back to his hometown, and the adventure starts from there. <laughs> it's a road buddy book, you might say. Okay. <laughs> so, what are the basic ingredients of a story for you? I, know, I like character-driven stories more than anything. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm not real big on plot. At all. <laughs> me either, which is why you see what you see over my shoulder. This whiteboard behind me. Okay. This is a plot for a book that I've I, been I, ignoring I, for three years. No kidding. I've got books that I've bought on plot from the Plot Whisperer. Shout out! It's wonderful. I love the book. Um, but I'm trying to figure out because we well, we sometimes we started out as readers. I was a reader ever since I was a little girl. And when you're a reader, you learn intuitively what's in a book. Plotting is not something we were taught in communications, mass journalism, because I, too, went to college for journalism at first. Yeah, well, you're kind of taught that plotting is important, I think, back when you're <laughs> plotting along in elementary and high school. <laughs> but you're a character-driven book. Well, I like to think that, you know. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a, you know, a book that has a lot of twists and turns, you know. That, some people swear by that, you know. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. I mean, if you write a mystery, you're going to have some plots, or a plot, and, you know, some uh, topsy-turvy <laughs> storyline, so. Do you sit down and write anything before you start writing your book? I used to try to. I don't so much anymore. I, I'll, very ske I'll, I'll write a very sketchy kind of outline. Like, okay, I want to have this character do this, but I won't. It's, it's very vague. You know, I, I trust my instincts when I get down, when I get right down to it. I, uh, you know, I get to the keyboard, I figure, oh, it's, it'll work. It, it, it'll work its way out. I'm like, this is the first draft and get it down fast and just don't worry about, you know, where so you the story's go going. I, I'm not sure where the story's going. Okay, that I, was going to be my question. I think I have a vague idea before I even start a story, but it doesn't always work out that way. Okay. So. My husband writes a lot. Similar. Yeah. I don't know how, that, I don't know how it's going to end. And when I sit down and I tell him, hey, you need to, you know, put down more information like yeah. who's who are the characters where are they going well, we're all different What's, and i just and he he refuses to yeah i i <laughs> i don't i don't like to write myself into a corner <laughs> so to speak that's probably what i've done with this book <laughs> this book over my shoulder deadline yeah. is one that i just i i've been ignoring it for about 2 or 3 years I, every every new year i go onto my okay. website and i change the date coming winter 2018 <laughs> i give myself another year to just ignore this yeah. book yeah well it's interesting isn't it the way we're all different i mean some people i i remember being reading something that John McPhee wrote a number of years ago. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with him, uh, but I can recall when I was in college, John McPhee, and I, I'm reading this John McPhee account about how he, his whole writing process, and it was just so uh, structured and detailed, and he can't even start writing until he knows exactly where to go from point A to B to C to D. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I don't know if I really want to ever write. <laughs> if that's what you have to do, because he was a successful writer. Exactly. But, you know, that was his way of doing it. That's not my way of doing it. it I'm learning that it's not my way. I'm trying it. <laughs> but what sticks in my mind is the Elmore Leonard's okay. Ten Rules for Writing. Cut the hoopty doodle. 
who's supposed to be one of the great dialogue writers. You know, the I late, do write. Great Elmer Leonard. I enjoy writing dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Most of I, I I don't have the scenery too much in yeah. the back. To me, it's always an afterthought. Um, Dialogue is important to me, so maybe that's why I like him. I also like <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut when he yeah. says, you know, hey, tell them what you're going to tell them. <laughs> don't don't surprise them, which is probably why I can't write a decent mystery. Although, in one of my books, West Wind, there was a little bit of a mystery, and um, I didn't even know yeah. it was going to happen. Right. Because, like you, I was kind of pantsing, you know, sitting down <laughs> by the seat of your pants and just writing a story. Then all of a sudden, this little thing happened, and I went, uh-huh. I did it. But, but, ha- a- yeah. but having said all that, I mean, I can be, be away from my writing and just be staring out the window someday or walking or driving and all of a sudden something will hit me. I think, boy, I should put that in my book. But I don't, but I don't write it down when that, when that thought comes to me. And maybe, because it's maybe, imprinted. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll, u- maybe I'll use that stray thought that entered my mind that I thought was such a good idea. Or maybe I won't. Well, what are you working on right now? <laughs> right now, I'm finishing up a book that I that I, I'm pulling out after 20 years, and it's about a guy who lives in the North Woods here of Pennsylvania, and he's got this life that he's carved out for himself as a fishing guide and a fly fisherman, and and all of a sudden, development's coming, <laughs> and his and his whole life's changing. And he's a middle-aged guy, and he's he's trying to cope with that. And there's a friend he has who's who um, you know is dying, and it's that's the story. I mean, it, it goes right. from there. It's 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 about this guy trying to cope with it, and it's it's supposed to be a humorous story too. And and of course, there's a girl who enters his life, you know, who's trying to change him, and so he's. That's what that story's about. Is your I think I'm going to call it Fishing for Sanity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. So tell me, is your writing a form of therapy? Probably is, but it, although it's not intended to be. I know I know the days the days I don't write, I hate myself. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I don't I I wouldn't call it self-loathing so much. It's just yeah. I, I, I don't like myself as well today because I didn't write. <laughs> do you have any hobbies besides writing? Uh, what, what do I do besides writing? Well, I go fishing a lot, you know, and, uh, you know, I dabble a little bit with baseball still. I play in an old guy's league, so, yeah, I have hobbies. I like to read a lot, like you. I'm a voracious reader. <laughs> yeah, I notice you keep looking at my books, my books on my bookcase over there. Well, I mean, you've got this Zen and the Art of Writing. They might see a Natalie Goldberg book around yes, somewhere. Yes, yes. You know, yeah, some of these, some of these gurus of writing, you know, and uh, yeah, but you know, Catch Twenty Two. Yes, <laughs> and Steinbeck. Yes, because I, I was really into Steinbeck when I was younger, and then I and then I went out to the Steinbeck Museum in California when I was out in California a few years ago. So that was pretty cool. But anyway, <laughs> there is a book up there that I haven't finished, and that's uh, supposedly the best book ever written is Ulysses. Have you yeah. have no, you I, ever I, finished I, I'm, it? I'm too intimidated to read Ulysses. I try to people who've read Ulysses. They said, "Well, I don't know what he's really talking about." You know? There's only one person I know isn't who's ever dream? read Ulysses and pretends like he knows everything about it. And isn't like, it a dream? Isn't it? Isn't it based on? A, don't know. Did never finish. Isn't it one long? I got through of, Beowulf. But not yeah. Ulysses. Isn't Ulysses one long it's, stream of consciousness? It is a stream of consciousness, and and the the grammar punctuation, and all of that's kind of missing, and you know, there's no cues for me visually. Um, but more than that, I just kind of got bored. Yeah, so I just kind of got bored with it. Yeah, I'd I, rather read Emmett's New Pig rather than, which is a, a book I stole from um, the Riff program <laughs> in second grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm, well, I'm too intimidated to read Ulysses, and I'm too intimidated to read Thomas Pynchon. You know, I need a Thomas Pynchon book like Gravity's Rainbow. You know? <laughs> well, you know, when, when I was little, I remember my, my books that I read as a, as a young child were my mother's books, because she was in the Book of the Month Club, and I would read... I would read books about Nazi Germany. Um, I would read about being a slave in Russia. You know, all of these books as a child, To Kill a Mockingbird, yeah. one of my favorites... Uh, but it wasn't, um, 
I don't know if that's what drove me so much as comic books. My brother right. was a massive comic book right? collector. Is that right? What and comic, I read what comic books. Oh, every comic book. Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> you know the, the war comic books. Um, Spider Man was always our okay. favorite. Okay. Um, Wolverine. And we're talking back in the 70s here. Okay. Late 60s, all, right. all the way through the 70s. And I read every comic book he had. And then I moved into science fiction, and, and science fiction became my, right. my next big love. And that's probably one of my favorite genres is 1950s, 1960s era sci-fi. I love classic sci-fi. Okay. I have one final question for you. I, I need to wrap up because I know that you've got to get back to your job. Um, everybody, you know, we're filled with stories. Everybody knows that, you know, they've got a story they want to write. They're working on this particular thing. Is there a story that you know you're never going to write? That you made up, that you thought, I should put that down someday, but nah, it's never going to happen. And if there is, would you like to tell me a little bit about that story right now? That right. book you're never going to write. I can't think of anything, really. I, <laughs> I don't know. I Maybe it's a short story. I can't, I can't really say that. <laughs> Maybe it was a short story you thought you may have wanted to write when you were younger, and you're going, nah, I'm going to have to give up on this. Here's what's going to happen. You asked me this question. I'm going to leave here, and I'll... Uh, Maybe a thought will come to me, <laughs> and I'll say, well, come to think of it, I guess there is a story. I, I never think I'm going to write, even though I'd like to. But offhand here, I can't think of anything. And this comes back <laughs> to the concept of the muse. Now, I ask this question of people because, because some writers believe that there is a muse. And the idea is that if you don't listen to the muse, if you don't sit down and do what the muse urges you to do, the muse is going to walk out of your life going to leave you you on the other hand don't feel that way you don't believe that there's a muse tapping you on the shoulder talking to you telling you well what to write at least not at any one particular moment uh i mean yeah but you do have you inspiration do, you, do, you do get you do get thoughts you do get inspiration you do get you know certainly that, you get you do get taps on the shoulder, but but to sit down and wait for it to to come. I mean, no. I I I think you just have to sit down every day as much as you can, as many days as you can, and write and get into that momentum and just do the process. You know, <laughs> instead get to of, work instead of waiting two weeks or a month. You know, and then take another month off until that creative process comes back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where is, it, is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, no. Well, if you it, if you want to write, just do it. You know, I mean, um, you know, if you think you want to write, you probably do. If you think you have a book in you, you probably do. Uh, and just do it. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Guess that, like, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Is yeah. fear. A, leap of, a leap of faith, I guess. You know. You spend like, a lot like of time books. being brave, don't you? You go to work every day as a journalist and uh, have to put out stories. I don't call it bravery. I call, I call it having to do it. Well, if you think making, about it. Making a living. I don't know. I've, I, I was a journalist, too. And that when I was younger, at first, I thought it was an exhilarating thing to do, mm -hmm. to be a reporter, to be a writer. And then, after a while, it got to be you know, uh, a, an obstacle in my life. It's like, oh, no, I must go write an article. You know, and if I didn't have the five W's to follow, mm -hmm. would I be able to do it? I don't know. I think it's an act of bravery to sit down every day and write an, something that you're going to put your name on for people to read. Well, it's a living. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming out here today, hanging out with me by well, the look river. Look at the spectacular view. I know. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed my interview with Mike Ruther, and it inspires you to sit down with your book idea and just do it. Mike's a reporter with a daily newspaper. He can't afford to make excuses about why he can't write or let writer's block get in the way of his work. He's inspired me to get to work, to quit making excuses about having writer's block, 
and waiting for that muse to return. I've decided to adopt his sensible approach. I hope you will too. You can find his books online at Amazon.com and you can find me at RobinVanAuken.com. While you're on my site, download my novel, West Wind. It's free. And speaking of free, I've got half a dozen free resources for writers and other creatives. So sign up today. Check out the episode and show notes at RobinVanAuken.com, session four. Thank you so much. And if you haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button on your device. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.